continuing our journey through the minor prophets, um, having made it through Obadiah, Jonah, now we come to Micah this morning, um, seven chapters. Again, we know we haven't been going verse by verse. We've just been hitting these and picking up some of the key points along the way where we've been asking the question, is COVID-19 and everything we're going through, is it a judgment? Is it God-given? Is it discipline for the church? And the answer that I've been giving every week is, I don't know. But we do know that in the days of the prophets, um, there were people even who were hearing the words of the prophets who were saying, no, that can't be. It's just those greedy Assyrians. It's just those mean, nasty Babylonians. It's just locusts. It's just a plague. And wanted, wanted to do everything they could to say God had nothing to do with it because if God did have something to do with it, then they knew where the responsibility was to repent. And so I don't know what the answer is, but I do know uh, that God is God. The Lord is Lord. He is sovereign. And I do know that there's no such thing as a bad time to repent. So this is a good time for us to humble ourselves in his sight um, because we know that the buck stops with him uh, in this universe. And um, back at the beginning of this, back in March, when, it, uh, when we saw COVID-19 coming and we were, things were starting to happen and um, restrictions were starting to be put in place, a guy that, by the name of Andy Crouch wrote a really good essay, a two-part essay, for kind of what we were looking at. You look back now, and, you, and, and I'm reading it, and I'm going, wow, that was um, so insightful, almost prophetic, what he wrote back then. But he described um, the different approaches we might take to what was going on with COVID-19. Um, he said it's, it would be very easy for you to see this as a blizzard. Uh, those of you who grew up around blizzards know that there's only one thing to do in a blizzard, and that's wait it out. Um, but give it a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, and it'll thaw, and it'll get back to life as normal, right? So if you see this as a blizzard, then you know just you'd wait a few weeks, and, and it'll melt, and that hasn't happened, has it? Um, we're not thawing out yet. Um, as a matter of fact, it seems that we just keep getting hit with bl- blizzards, and that was his advice, was don't see this as a blizzard, see this as winter time. See us as entering into a, a period of months um, where it's just a different season, and... Uh, this week has been hard, and it's felt uh, like a blizzard in an already cold winter season. And um, his advice also was that we have to also be careful um, in our thinking and in our expectations and the way we treat each other and the way we act because what we definitely don't want to enter into is an ice age. Um, we don't want to enter into, you know, what they experienced in Narnia, where it was always winter and never Christmas, right? We don't want to enter into an experience, an extended time of just freezing winter where it's just blizzard after blizzard after blizzard. And so we pray uh, for this to be a winter, even though we don't know exactly when spring is coming. Um, and we pray God would give us the grace because what God is really after is a certain kind of person and a certain kind of people. And when these blizzards of judgment were passing through uh, the northern people in Israel and, and the southern part of Judah, um, it would have been very easy to just see it as a, as a one-time event, and then we'll wait this out and everything will be okay. But God told them time and again, that's not the case. You're entering into winter time. You're entering into an age, uh, a time of difficulty that you have brought on, and, and your sin is up to here, and now I must do something. Um, and... Uh, they needed to see this as, as winter time, even though the one thing we've seen in every prophet, Jonah was a little different, right? But every prophet has given a promise of a, of a future kingdom, of a future day, when God would restore and heal things better than they'd ever known. And so there was a, an eternal, if you will, springtime coming, even if the prophets could not say specifically where it was on the horizon. And we get um, some of the most famous, really, uh, biblical prophecies this morning in the book of Micah about what that springtime um, will be like. But they were not given a date <laughs> when spring would start, so it was just, um, you need to be repentant and humble because I'm looking for a certain kind of person during this winter. Those of you who um, who grew up in really cold places, uh, you some of you have lived in places where wintertime was a matter of life and death, where you didn't take 
you didn't take winter lightly because um, winter was the real deal and life and death. And it was always the same people who suffered. It was the poor who were unable to prepare as well who suffered, the, maybe the people who weren't looked after that needed to be looked after by those who had more. Um, and that's always been the case in each of the minor prophets we looked at. Um, judgment came um, because the people who should have known better were mistreating the poor and they were working for bribes and they were mistreating the immigrants. And it's going to be the same thing again today. I'm not going to tell you anything new in that department. And that's been the case in our own country and all over the world. Um, When school went online, it was the poor who suffered the most. And through all of this, the, the poor have suffered the most. And so we really want to look at Micah and ask ourselves the question, a couple of questions. What kind of person is God looking for through all of this? And um, this uh, comes at, at no better time when people have been posting verses, Bible verses from Micah all over social media. Um, how did all those people know I was going to preach on that? I don't know, but thank you, everyone. But it's, it's so, so appropriate that we would hit this book at this time. It's almost as if God knew uh, what was going on, right? And um, what kind of person is he looking for? But then in the midst of, of asking who is he trying to make us, what is he trying to, to people is he trying to form here, um, the imp- there's a very important question, and I haven't asked this question yet, but maybe this came to mind for some of you. Um, if springtime is coming and God has promised it, and if he's going to make all things new and if he's going to keep the covenant on his end of things, um, then why repent? Right. Well, if God's already promised a happy ending, then why repent now? And that's part of what uh, Mike is going to answer for us. And not just why repent, but how. What that's going to look like. Um, can we repent? I know this is going to sound like a strange thing to say, but we'll see this in just a minute in chapter 7. Can we repent with confidence? Um, and the answer is yes, and we'll see that this morning. Um, going through the first couple of chapters of Micah, he, God says again, I'm coming, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk on the mountains and just crush them down like you would step on an anthill, um, and it, the valleys are going to split open, it's just going to melt like wax before me. And he says right there in chapter 1, verse 5, and all of this is for the transgressions of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. Um, this is coming because of your sin. And what is the transgression of Ga- Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So he goes um, right to the heart of these countries where their leaders were, where their heart of worship was, because that's where the problem was. And as a matter of fact, um, he used this term high place, and this is a very derogatory thing because all of the idolatry, all the worship of the other gods took place in the high places. Um, and, he's, and what does he say? He says, your, your places of, we, of worship have become places of idolatry. Um, your places of worship, the, the, your capital cities, if you will, and your, your, your centers of worship um, have become places where true worship doesn't even happen, and that's what coming. And so he goes all through chapter 1 and uh, chapter 2 just, just uh, describing um, their hearts and their sin and describing uh, what is coming. And then when you get to chapter 3, um, I, can, I can just go down to a couple of verses in chapter 3, starting in verse 9, um, where he just kind of sums it up who he's talking to and what they've done. Chapter 3, verse 9. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. So, so he gets right to the heart of the problem here. Um, it's your leaders. Uh, some of you have Bible translations that have it as three Ps. It's your princes, your priests, and your prophets. It's your government officials who take something that's straight and make it crooked. They, they are doing all of this for what they can get out of it. Instead of being elected to a position where they serve the people um, that, that they're in the position for, 
there were no elections, so they come into this, right? And, and instead of rising to the place of power uh, to be servants, they do it um, to get rich. And so what should be justice and what should be straight is made crooked, crooked, and they just do enrich themselves with bribes. And he says, and because of that, I'm, I'm coming down to you, and says in verse 11, he sums it all up, um, I will give judgment for a bribe. In other words, if, when, I, when it comes to um, determining justice, when two people become before me with their case, the case is decided by who can give me the most. So you get justice um, if you can give something to me, which means that the poor were never getting justice and justice was never actually happening. And so when people would travel to the temple, which everybody was still doing, this was a great time of prosperity, people were still going through the motions, as we'll see in just a moment. People were still going and offering sacrifices, but when they came there, instead of arriving to a priest who was ready and willing to teach, um, the priest was charging a fee for his services. And instead of going to the prophet and hearing, this is the word of the Lord, Uh, you could get a favorable word from the Lord for the right price. And if you didn't pray, uh, pay the right price to the prophet, well, then you got a a woe, you got a bad news, right? So um, give to the prophet and all will go well with you. I'll give you a word from God that it's going to go well with you. That should sound familiar, right, if you've ever turned on a TV, right? So it's the prince, it's the priests, it's the prophets, and they're all perverting justice. They've all twisted their jobs in a prideful arrogant way so that they benefit from it. And so he says, because of that, disaster is on the way. Now, um, there are a couple of promises here that really bring Micah together. And once again, this is, this is what we've seen time again. This is a, this is a familiar pattern um, with a little extra promise thrown in. And what we're going to see is, is that you and I live between these two promises. We've seen one of them fulfilled already, and we're waiting for the other. And so for, for the people that first heard Micah, both of these were future. Um, and so one of the promises is the one we have not seen fully fulfilled yet, and it's in chapter 4, and I want to read some of this to you because these are some very um, well-known verses. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, It shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so just, just, you can almost close your eyes and see this. You can see Jerusalem lifted up above every other mountain, above every other hill, and you can just see the nations coming. You can see all the paths and all the roads and all the highways filled with people coming uh, to worship and coming uh, to receive justice and coming to hear the word of the Lord. And it says that he shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. But they shall sit every man under his vine and every and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of our Lord, our God, forever and ever. So the day is going to come when God will execute perfect judgment, when the Lord will execute perfect, judge, perfect judgment, and there will be no need for weapons. So they'll take that sword and make a plow out of it. They'll take that spear and make a pruning hook out of it, and, and there will be no more war because the word of the Lord is coming out of Zion. The justice of the Lord is coming out of Zion. Be a light to the nations. But look, this is so crucial, Look in verse 4, starting chapter 4, starting in verse 6, at how he's going to do this. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame, and I will gather those who've been driven away, and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame will make the remnant of those, and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. Do you see what he's going to do? We, you, you saw this verse on the screen. You heard it read. Um, it's the meek who will inherit the earth. 
right? It's the, the, the kingdom belongs to the poor in spirit. So when Jesus comes back, it's not going to be, um, way to go, Christians. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you managed to get all the earthly power you could. It's no, I'm going to take the last, I'm going to make them first. I'm going to take the, 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 la- the ladder and, and turn it upside down. I'm going to take the pyramid, turn it upside down, and I'm going to take the weak and give them strength, and I'm going to take the poor and give them the riches, and I'm going to take the people who have served. You remember what he said? Those who will lead will, will serve now, and, and they will be responsible for much, right? And so J- Jesus shows us in the Gospels, but he showed us ahead of time. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, those Beatitudes should not have been a surprise. It should have been, wow, that sounds just like the prophets because the prophet was speaking. So, um, it's so insightful for us, so necessary for us to hear that, um, that the promise of the future kingdom um, isn't for the people who hoarded up as much power and as much wealth, as much position, as much fame, as much security in this world as they could. It was for the people who gave it away. It was for the people who became poor. It was for the people who became meek and who became servants. That's what the kingdom will look like. And so that's the first promise that you and I have yet to see fulfilled. We long for it. We pray for it. We pray your kingdom come, right? But then there's another promise that we have seen, and you're going to recognize this. There's a promise in chapter 5, and if you're if your Bible has little headings on it, mine says the ruler to be born in Bethlehem. Um, so how is this kingdom going to work? Doesn't a kingdom need a king? Let me tell you about the king. If you remember when the wise men showed up and they came to Herod and we said, they said, where's the one born king of the Jews? We followed his star. You remember Herod went and sent off for like the teachers and the scribes and all those guys and said, hey, um, what, what do your, your holy books say? about your king. Where's he going to come from? And they went and they came back to him with these words from Micah and they said, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Um, So he's saying there's going to be a kingdom, but let me tell you about this king. Um, This king is going to be from nowhere. Um, This king is going to become from the most insignificant little place on your map, and yet that one will be the ruler in Israel. And look at how he's described. His coming forth is from old, from ancient of days, so he's eternally young, if you will. Uh, He may show up in human form as a baby in Bethlehem, but he existed long before that. Um, Before the mountains were brought forth, the psalmist says, you are God. So the eternal one, the eternal king, will step into time in the most humble of fashion once again. He will come humbly, um, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Uh, Being made in human likeness, he became a servant uh, even unto death, right? That's what Paul tells us in Philippians. And so there's a future promise of a kingdom in chapter 4. There's a future promise of a king in chapter 5, and it will be a humble, a king who humbled himself, um, who will give great blessing and a great kingdom to people who humbled themselves. And so when we sing, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up, these are all the promises that we claim from the New Testament and from the Psalms that he gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud. Why? Because the proud don't think they need it but the humble do. So on into chapter 5. It talks about a remnant that will be scattered and then gathered together. And then in chapter 6, he asks, God asks of the people some um, very pointed questions in a, in a backward sort of way, if you will. He says in chapter 6, verse 3, O oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. So it's like God says to his people, Really, what did I do wrong? Um, How did I make, did I make this too hard for you? Um, What did I do? In other words, was the the fault on my end? And the obvious answer is, of course not. And then in verse 4 and 5, look what he does in verse 4 and 5. He reminds them of what a great 
and gracious and powerful Savior he has been in their lives. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So it's like, you were slaves. I sent you leaders who brought you out. Do you remember I did that for you? And he says, and my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, the, Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. So it's like, and, and after I brought you out, do you remember when uh, the foreign king, the, the, the Moabite king, uh, hired a prophet to speak curses to you, but every time he opened his mouth, a curse wouldn't come out. He can only bless because that's the way I work. Do you remember that? Do you remember how I blessed you in the wilderness? And he says, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal that you know may, may know the saving acts of the Lord? You know those two cities. Shittim's the last place they camped um, on the east side of the Jordan before they went to the promised land. Gilgal, the first place they camped. Right. Do you remember what it took me to get you from desert into promised land and all I did between those two places, right? And, and so he's just like, your history with me is just me being powerful and gracious and good on your behalf, bringing you out of slavery, blessing you in the wilderness, bringing you into the promised land, all my works of power. So what is the problem here? Is it me? Is it something have I done, Right. And so they would naturally be asking the question when we come in Micah 6. What is it you're after, God? And this is so crucial. Look in Micah 6, verse 6. Okay, Lord, um, we get where you're coming from. We hear your promises. We see you um, calling judgment on our injustice and our lack of of grace towards and generosity towards the poor and the downtrodden. Um, we are people without justice. So then what, what should we do? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So it's like, okay, God, we hear you. What do you want? Do you want more sacrifices? Do you want us to sing more loudly? Do you want us to offer more than we ever offered before? Do I have to give a kid? And, and God was, has been telling them all throughout the prophets, right? No, I don't even want to hear you sing. I don't want to see your offerings. In other words, We've been doing this same thing in the temple. Maybe we need to turn it up to 11. Maybe we need to offer more. Maybe, maybe we need to do that more. And, and if you remember in the past prophets, he's like, no, that's the very thing I'm sick of because for you it's just a show. It's just a photo opportunity to be seen by people in power. The princes come and they go and worship and then you come and you worship, right? And it's all just... A show to you, it's empty, and that's not what I want. What I want is a certain kind of person. The person I want is verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. Let me tell you what's good, the prophet says. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness or mercy and to walk humbly with your so in other words, Micah's telling you, he's already told you what he wants. He's already told you what's good. What's good and what he requires is that you do justice or you do justly and that you love kindness, you love mercy and you walk humbly with God. And I, I love how he puts this together and how he says you act justly and you do justice is something you do and you love to be kind, and you love to show mercy. Because we'd love to reverse this. We would love to say, oh, I love justice, especially when it's for the people that I think need it, right? Yeah, God, I'd love if you would be just for those people and those people and those people. And he's like, no, no, no. What I want is for you to do justice. What I want for you is to act justly towards those other people. Right, and we, all, we know who the other people are. This is becoming more and more clear to us through the prophets and through the world in which we live. Um, I don't want you to just talk about justice. I don't want you to just say you love it when those people get it and it goes right. 
but I want you to do it. I want you to act it. To live it out. And then when you do mercy, don't do it because you have to. When you show kindness, don't do it because you have to, because it's just your duty. I want you to love that. I want mercy to be something that flows out of the inside of you. I want kindness to be not something that someone had to twist your arm to do, but because you love that and to walk humbly with your God. Humility. Humility has been said. It's the, it's the character trait we love the most in other people, right? Um, I've heard people say, that humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And that's only partly true, because I guarantee you that there were people who were hearing the voice of Micah who did need to think less of themselves. They thought way too much of themselves. They thought that the world revolved around them, right? And so, yeah, you need to think less of yourself. You're not the great one you think you are. I am. But you need to think of yourself less. That would be a blessed place to be with it. And so just walk with me, he says, walk. Just walk with me humbly. And when you're humble, you're not fighting for your place. You're not fighting for what you get. You can, you can be poor in spirit. You can be meek, and you can just let me give to you and provide for you what you need. So do justice, love mercy, and just walk with me in humility. Think of yourself less and then think of yourself rightly. Um, when you're walking with God, he will help if you think of yourself rightly. So humility isn't like beating yourself up and just, blah, and just what an awful person I am and groveling. It's just, Lord, help me to see myself for who you say I am. And then let me go into acts of justice and, and deeds of kindness with just a self-forgetfulness where I'm not even worried about me because... I'm just here to receive and give. So in all of this, when we're saying that this is a great time to repent, the question comes, well, what kind of person is he, he trying to make of us? Um, wouldn't it be amazing if we, we came through this, not just this blizzard, but if we came through this winter time, uh, this season, and we came out on the other side and the church was even known more and more and more uh, for people who do justice and people who love mercy. And if I may say so, um, the church should be leading in the way in this. Um, the church should have been leading the way in this um, the whole time. It seems that when it comes to justice and mercy, the, the church is always playing catch up. <laughs> We're always riding on the coattails of, of what's going on in the world when the world should be looking to the church and going, oh, that's what justice for the poor looks like. That's what justice for the immigrant looks like. That's what justice for, the, for people who have less looks like. That's what it looks like to serve with gladness, and that's what it looks like to be humble. Um, we should be leading the way in this. Um, we should be taking uh, the first step in what this looks like, but it seems as if the church is constantly trying to catch up with this. And I know that there are people in the sound of my voice right now. Um, I know some of you very specifically and then others broadly who have the same testimony that um, it was 50, 60 years ago when the church was leading the way in injustice that many people got fed up with the church, right? Because the church was saying one thing about the grace of God and one thing about the mercy of God, but they were um, oppressing people left and right. And it's time for the church to step up with that. And let's finish, because I know God is calling us to repentance, but we need to know what this looks like. And I'm telling you, church, Micah 7, starting in verse 7, you can hang your hat on these verses. You can build a life out of these verses. This is uh, what one of, my favorites, one of my favorite pastors calls these verses, the verses, how did he say it? Um, the gutsy guilty. <laughs> How do I bring my guilt to God in a confident way? That just sounds so opposite of how we think about it. I just call this confident repentance. And when we read this and we try to hear this in the context in which it was given, we try to hear this coming through the prophet to God's uh, people, 
And then we realize what this is like on the other side of Micah 5, where we already know the king in gospel terms. This is going to just be beautiful. So I w- put Micah 7, uh, 7 through 10 somewhere where you can read it and meditate on it and think about it, because this is what it says. Listen to what confident repentance looks like. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. Repeat it over and over again. We've seen this with every promise. Prophet, look to the Lord, look to the Lord. I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. And my God will hear me. Such confidence he's, he's speaking about here. For a prophet, he's talking about judgment. Oh, I will look to the Lord and I will wait for the God of my salvation. He's my, he's my salvation, not anything I drum up. And he will hear me. Then he looks around and he says, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So in other words, all the countries, all the nations around Israel were now mocking them. They're like, oh, well, look at them. Them and their God must not have got along too well. Things aren't going so well for them and they would gloat over them and rejoice over them. And he says, no, no, no. Um, I'm going to fall, but I will rise. It's going to get dark, but God will be my light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light and I shall look upon his vindication. In other words, I am in a covenant relationship with God and I will bear his discipline. I will bear his judgment. I will bear his indignation because of my sin, but... He will plead my cause and he will execute judgment and this day of darkness will become a day of light. Then my enemy will see and shame will cover her who said to me, where is the Lord your God? And my eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. Isn't this beautiful on this side of the cross. It's this beautiful on this side of the king coming and the king dying and the king rising. Let's think of this in gospel terms. Let's go back, start again at verse seven with me. As for me, I will look to the Lord. And I will wait. I will wait patiently. I will wait still in stillness. I will wait in quiet for the God of my salvation. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my Savior. I will wait for him, and he will listen. He will hear. Rejoice not over me, my enemy, when I fall. Friends, are you comforted by the word when? (laughs) Rejoice not if I just happen to fall. Could happen, might not, probably won't, but you never know. Now, it's, it's, it's going to happen. We're, we're going to fall. We're going to stumble. We're going to sin. But we get back up again. We surrender ourselves sometimes to darkness and walk on a dark path, and we allow darkness to fill us. And we can say with confidence, but the Lord will be light. The Lord will come to me in here and come to me as light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. I've sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. Is that not a beautiful picture of the, 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 the gospel? Jesus Christ has borne our judgment. Jesus Christ has borne the indignation of the Lord. Jesus Christ pleads our case before the Father. Can't wait to get back into First John to just talk about that week after week. Jesus Christ pleads our case before the Father. So we look at Jesus Christ, the God of our salvation, and the God of our salvation, Jesus says here, let me take this to the Father for you because I bore this for you. He brings us into light so that when the enemy looks at the church, the the enemy shouldn't look at the church and say, where's your God? The enemy should look at the church and say, wow, their God is gracious and kind. What good news they have. And he's obviously working on their behalf and working through them. They are a blessing to the world. They are what justice looks like. They are what mercy looks like. So you can take this prayer and just think of it in gospel terms and you can just build a life on this. What great, great 
news, what great truth for our repentance. We talked about this week after week, but what a great verse to take as your own. So, if spring is coming, why repent if it's coming? Because God is making a people. He's building a people. He's told us what is good. He's told us what is required of him. And he's making a kingdom, a kingdom coming, and he sent the king to be king over us, his people, to the ends of the earth. We pray with me? Lord, I pray that those within the sound of my voice right now, those who will be within the sound of my voice later, God, that um, you're the only king forever. You are our king. God, I just pray that you'd help us to repent well. Lord, it is... Uh, it may be strange to our ears to hear that we can repent with confidence. Our repentance comes with great humility, Lord. But it also comes with the confidence of knowing that Jesus Christ has bore our sin on the cross and he's risen again from the dead and he's borne not just the weight of our sin, but the wages of our sin is death. And so we don't come with our chest being pounding our chest, look at us. We come saying, look at Jesus, and we come humbly before you, our God. This is the kind of people that the gospel creates. How can we act justly and love mercy? Because you have acted justly, and you have loved mercy. And it's all in the death of our king and the resurrection of our king. You've gone before us. You've led the way. So, Lord, your church can lead the way in this world. And we don't care if the news covers it. We don't care if we get a pat on the back. Lord, we just want the world to be different because we showed what justice and mercy looked like when carried out with a humble, joyful heart, saturated with the light of the gospel. In the name of the Jesus, Jesus, our Savior, our King. His name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. Look forward to seeing you.